But now, without much further ado, I'm going to hand over to Matt. So, um, as I said, we're very lucky to have Associate Professor Matthew Harrison joining us today from Tassie. Matt's the Director of the Carbon Storage Partnership and Systems Modelling Team Leader at the University of Tasmania. He leads a multidisciplinary team that's examining holistic approaches for reducing crop and livestock greenhouse gas emissions in a profitable, sustainable and productive way. Much of Matt's work examines the impacts of climate change and with extensive participatory involvement from farmers, agronomists and industry, his team have developed systems-based adaptations to increasingly frequent extreme weather events such as drought, heat waves and flash flooding. Matt's very involved with MLA work, focused on the industry target of becoming carbon neutral by 2030, some of which has involved participation by regional NRM organisations, including um, South Coast NRM. Uh, today, Matt's going to talk to us about some of his current research, including effects of sustainable agriculture on soil carbon and pathways for improving carbon sequestration in soils and vegetation, although he did flag a bit of a twist in what he's going to present today. So um, I'll leave it, I'll hand over to him to more fully introduce his topic here. Yeah, so th th thanks very much, Rachel, and thanks very much for everyone to coming. I, I understand that you're all busy. Um, uh, the twist um, was sort of introduced in Rachel's uh, background, and thanks for that big bio, Rachel, but really just the climate change element. People talk a lot about greenhouse gas emissions mitigation and carbon, it tends to be in isolation. Um, so, um, so I'll talk a little bit about it. another project that I lead. It's called the Nexus Project. It's looking at the nexus between productivity, profitability, greenhouse gas emissions and social licence or social acceptability of the livestock sector. Um, so we're really looking at mitigation, carbon and adaptation at the same time. So probably the key message out of it all, um, some of it is pretty detailed, what I'm about to show, but probably the key message is that um, the ability to sequester carbon in future in many regions will go down. So that should be considered, particularly in drier or semi, more semi-arid regions, particularly South Australia and, and inland upper northern Victoria and inner WA. So what I'll try and do, I don't know whether you wanted to record or you already are, Rachel, I'll just see if I can share my screen. Um, Now it's always fun with Zoom and PowerPoint. Um, can you see what what can you see now? You can see the presentation. I think it's on the. It's on display. Okay. Yeah, well, on display. Yeah. I'll see if I can stop sharing. Um, <laughs> I'll try again. Sorry for the confusion. It's okay. It's always a bit hard to get PowerPoint up the way you want it with this new PowerPoint. Yeah, that looks hit, good. <laughs> when you hit slideshow, it um, it switch, switches the screen. So I won't I won't hold on any longer. But um, it's called the Nexus Project because we're looking at the nexus between productivity, profitability, and greenhouse gas emissions. If anyone has any questions, let me know. Um, it's good to see many people that I know here today, many familiar names, and I haven't seen many people in person. So it's, it would be good to meet you later on if you if we're available for a discussion. Um, so the Nexus project um, has got farms essentially across the whole eastern seaboard of Australia from the top of Queensland to the midlands of Tasmania, about two and a half thousand kilometres apart. And so the production environments in which those farms are located are very different. Uh, so the North, North Queensland farm looks like this, typical rangeland farm, uh, extensive, really two seasons, dry season and wet season, very low productivity very low fertility. Um, the Eastern Gippsland farm, rolling green hills, temperate environment. The Northern Tasmanian farm is probably, the cows have probably got a better view than most people in Australia from where they live. Um, three sides of the property are surrounded by the sea, so a very maritime environment, 1.2 metres of rainfall a year. So the reason that we do that is because a climate change adaptation and indeed a mitigation option in one environment not might not necessarily be a mitigation option in another environment. So your ability to sequester carbon in the Tasmanian environment would arguably be, be a lot more than that one in Queensland simply because of rainfall. Um, so that's soil carbon, but you have different other, uh, other options for greenhouse gas emissions mitigation as well. 
Um, I won't go too much into the details, but basically it's a participatory project. So that means that we refine the modelling that we do based on feedback from industry experts, farmers and, and people like such as here today. So we, we calibrate the baseline models based on the real farm system. So we get the models reproducing the number of live weight, so, number of animals sold, the, the actual soil carbon, the amount of supplementary feed consumed, economic modelling as well. And then we go to this group of disciplinary experts and we say, well, what adaptations would you would you propose implementing for your farm system uh, under a future climate? So the first thing we do is we impose the future climate, 2030 or 2050, and show them what how their pasture production and livestock production and all the other metrics of a farm system will change. And given that impact of climate, we then say, well, what adaptations would you impose? So based on that feedback that we get, we go away and model that. So that ranges from everything from uh, the additional use of ag tech and using drones to monitor cattle in remote areas of Northern Australia um, to income diversification in Tasmania. So a sheep farm, if you're getting a, a hotter, drier climate, even in Tasmania in future, uh, the farmer actually proposed um, installing grapevines, irrigated grapevines. So if you get a bad year with your pastures and your pasture doesn't grow, um, what alternative income can you get from irrigated grapevines? So it's a form of income diversification. But we're essentially modelling what they ask us to do. Um, we're also looking at social acceptability. So we can look at the numerical side. We can model it biophysically with animal and sheep production and economic modelling as well. So we do stochastic, which is like a random um, uh, analysis of the, the costs and the profitability. We're also looking at, you know, um, non-numerical things. So what um, what issues would you see in implementing a proposed adaptation? What about consumer acceptance of a proposed adaptation, practical barriers to implementation, all that sort of thing. We've also got on-farm experiments. Um, so that's MLA have this terminology called involvement partner. Um, but essentially what we're doing in Tasmania, the Victorian and Queensland people are doing something different, but we're actually feeding uh, by our charter cattle, to calves rather, um, and so that's just fed out in the paddock. So they just eat as much as they like. That photo was taken, I think, in April, so some time ago, but they just eat it ad lib. Um, most of biochar is inert. Um, it goes through the animal. Um, it improves live weight gain, or supposedly. Um, because it goes through the animal, it comes out in, the, in, in enriched organic matter manure. That manure is taken into the soil. That's incorporated into the soil by dung beetles, so you improve your soil carbon. It also reduces enteric methane. So could it be a win-win-win, reduce enteric methane, improve live weight gain, improve soil carbon? Well, it remains to be seen, um, but we've got a, an on-farm experiment trying to test that now. Early results uh, indicate, and this, these black points are the biochar ones and the, um, and the open dots are the control. Early results, those bars indicate the variability, indicate that there's no difference, but we still need another point in time. Um, and if you look at the literature, the, the, the longer they're fed biochar, the more likely the difference in live weight is you may be seen, but it really depends on the type of biochar. So biochar ain't biochar. Um, that literature one there on the right-hand side is made from um, brewer's grain and rice straw. The one, the biochar that we're using is actually derived from wood, so it's pyrolyzed wood. So it very much depends, I think, on the type of biochar that you use, but remains to be seen what happens in Tasmania. Um, so to do the modelling, we're using, as you can imagine, and this is probably one thing, as I said at the start, um, consideration of multiple metrics and not just greenhouse gas emissions. We're looking at productivity with the model called grass grow. We're looking at soil carbon net greenhouse gas emissions, um, spatially explicit carbon and carbon in, in vegetation with full cam. Uh, we're doing economic analysis and we're also doing uh, social science, which is, which is called a discourse analysis. Um, we're looking at stacking interventions. So that means combining incremental 
adaptations and so they're contextualised bundles of greenhouse gas emissions and climate change adaptations and they're demand driven so they're defined by the working groups in each environment. Um, so we define four themes now because the, the, the actual individual changes to the farm system are very different depending on where you are, um, we define these four common themes across environments. So low hanging fruit, that's the typical ones that you could probably guess that farmer groups might ask for. So it's agronomy, uh, incorporation of legumes, improved animal feed conversion efficiency. So that means I gain more live weight for the amount of food that I eat. Um, so they're the typical ones. They're simple, they're reversible. So if you don't like it, you can take it off again. Um, then we had a towards carbon neutral. Now, the important thing about that TCN or towards carbon neutral is that it includes the low hanging fruit plus any other emissions mitigation intervention. And that might be feeding enteric methane supplements, for example, asparagopsis. Uh, we also looked at the effect of an enteric methane vaccine, which doesn't exist at the moment, but the, the, the idea is to look at what well, what effect would an enteric methane vaccine have at the whole farm level if it did exist? Would it have a big effect or not? It's really a scenario analysis. We looked at income diversification. So for Tasmania, um, the northwestern beef farm income diversification was putting wind turbines on his farm. So if you get a drought and you don't get much income from your pastures or your animals, what income would you get from wind turbines? Now, wind turbines, obviously, not everyone can do, but this, this, they are available to this farmer. And indeed, he's been approached by a wind company because he's right on the coast and he will get a turbine installed. So it was pertinent, I think, to model wind turbines. The other farmer was looking at ir irrigating, installing a, 20 hectares of irrigated grapevines. And we're looking at transformational. So transformational as a phrase is probably hackneyed. It's probably overused, but um, we're looking for what we're defining that as is a big change in emissions, productivity and profitability. We'll define transformational by stacking together a number of different incremental options, incremental adaptations, depending on which are most prospective. Um, I'll only talk about these two in the next couple of slides, this low hanging fruit one, and the towards carbon neutral. I won't talk about these two. Um, so for a sheep farm in Tasmania, um, hopefully you can see that now. We've got, we had to do a historical baseline, which is typically what you do for any carbon project. Um, so for this farm, the total, total emissions were about 7,000 tonnes of CO2 equivalents per annum. Um, the net emissions was 4.6, so 4,600 if you take away sequestration in soils and in vegetation. Um, when we come along and we modelled the same farm system with no change in 2050, um, emissions actually went up a little bit. That's because pasture production went up in northwestern Tasmania. Rainfall was about the same in 2050. Um, and this is the importance of doing modelling in different agroecological regions. In northwestern Tasmania, rainfall didn't really change, but temperature went up, particularly in the winter. So that encouraged pasture growth and you actually had more growth throughout the year. Um, probably the important thing though is that carbon sequestration, you can see that white chunk of the bars there went down. So in the absence of practice change, um, warmer, warmer climates, particularly in winter, will encourage soil respiration and that's loss of increased loss of soil carbon. So even though the total farm emissions are about the same, the actual gross emissions are much higher because sequestration is lower. Now, the low hanging fruit one is that you remember that those immediate simple and reversible farm cha changes that we did to the farm system. Emissions went up even further and that's because productivity went further. So in, in general, there's this tight coupling between productivity and greenhouse gas emissions. So if we increase productivity, we generally increase greenhouse gas emissions. So it's very important that in thinking about any one of these met metrics that you think about multiple metrics at the same time. So if you think about carbon farming, don't think about just carbon, think about productivity, profitability, and potentially other maladaptive or co-benefits associated with the, with the adaptation. It's usually part of a farm system. So you pull one part and you get a whole bunch of other changes. 
Um, towards carbon neutral, increased emissions even further. So that's that's total emissions. So that's 8,700. Um, so that's a 22% increase in greenhouse gas emissions relative to the emissions in the historical climate. So under a future climate, we've got more emissions in the in this Tasmanian farm. Um, if you look at the sequestration associated with soil carbon, so what we did in the towards carbon neutral is we said, well, he, he's got ryegrass pastures. What happens? One of his suggestions was more legumes, which is a common one. So we come along and said, what happens if we renovate the pastures with lucerne, which is a deep-rooted legume? 50% of the pasture composition is lucerne. And so that accounts for the growth of lucerne over time. It accounts for the soil type, accounts for the rainfall, accounts for daily changes, accounts for consumption of livestock and all of that stuff. Um, if you look at that green segment there, that green segment represents the net change in greenhouse gas emissions over the farm. Basically, very small, 3%. So even though lucerne is very deep rooted and it can grow deeper than other grass pastures, the effect on organic matter and soil carbon at the whole farm scale is very small. In contrast, if you look at um, reduction of enteric methane, now the VAC stands for um, vaccine, but um, it's really any mechanism that you have to reduce enteric methane. That could be a livestock supplement, it could be a bolus, it could be um, improving uh, reproduction efficiency, so culling unproductive animals. We had a 30% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. So probably the main point there is compare soil carbon mitigation with reducing enteric methane, particularly under a future climate. Big difference. Trees were sort of in between. So this farmer, who was a big farmer, he had a lot of native bushland. So he said, well, I would thicken those trees. I wouldn't necessarily plant more, but they were pretty sparse. So we looked at thickening at them with native trees in between. And that sort of had a 17% reduction in whole farm emissions. So sort of in between enteric methane vaccination inhibition and soil carbon. So when you stack them all together, the lucerne, the enteric methane mitigation and planting trees, you've got nearly a 50% mitigation in, in um, the actual towards carbon neutral. So that is probably another key message um, of this presentation that stacking appropriate incremental adaptations can result in pretty significant emissions mitigation, changes in productivity and changes in profit. So I just talked about emissions there. So what about productivity? Um, now I've noticed that I'm converting to a beef farm, so that could be a little bit confusing, but I'm gonna talk about productivity here. So I've got the bars still represent net farm emissions, but the points actually represent on this second axis, hopefully it's not too confusing, uh, live weight production. So for the baseline, it probably doesn't really matter the values. For the baseline, we had a 6% increase with the low hanging fruit in emissions. We had a 15% increase in productivity, which is good. So you've got a greater in improvement in productivity relative to the improvement in emissions with the low hanging fruit. Now, we these are all of the incremental changes, these individual bars that we did to the farm system. So we looked at raising stocking rates. We looked at shifting calving time. We looked at increasing root depth. We looked at increasing soil fertility. Uh, we looked at genetic increases in animal feed conversion efficiency. We looked at an enteric methane vaccine and we looked at planting trees. Um, so the bar represents the relative emissions. So the lower they are, the better. And the points represent productivity. So the higher they are, the better. So what you can start to see is that Enteric methane and planting trees, while good in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, didn't have any effect on productivity at all. No different to the baseline. So um, in contrast, incorporating lucerne does have an effect on productivity. So what do you really want to focus on? Um, and again, similar to the sheep situation, if you stack them all together with this towards carbon neutral or TCN, you get the greatest relative change in greenhouse gas emissions and productivity. So what about profit? So to complicate the situation again, um, what I've done here, well, this is actually done by Franco Pilotto, a, a, um, one of the people in the project team. He's looked at change in gross margin 
um, relative to the baseline. So the further it is out this way, the more profitable relative to the base farm. And the further it is out on this axis, the greater the emissions. So probably the main thing to look at again is that towards carbon neutral is more, more profitable than any others, followed by improving feed conversion efficiency of the animal and incorporating lucerne and all the others. Most of the others, except for low hanging fruit, didn't really have much of an effect on gross margin. So you've got one change in productivity, one change in emissions, and, and one, say, uh, one change in prof profitability. So again, be careful what metric you focus on. So we've published something similar, not that exact study, but similar in, um, in that link there. So that's called the, um, uh, we, we actually look at the interaction between greenhouse gas emissions, productivity and profitability for an extensive beef farming enterprise. Um, so I won't go into any more detail, but really just to distill some of the stuff that I've just shown, there was quite a few complex, tortuous messages there. Soil carbon will likely, soil carbon sequestration will likely decline under future climates. Uh, that's in the absence of any other change. So if you change management, well then your soil carbon sequestration could go up. In the absence of any change under a warmer climate, soil carbon sequestration will most likely go down under future climates, even if rainfall is the same. That's because the soil is warmer, respiration rates are higher, and you lose more CO2. The bugs are more active. Um, in any carbon farming intervention, you should look at productivity, profitability, and emissions, and maybe other things as well. So look at co-benefits and trade-offs. Um, the effect of any intervention is usually contextualised to the environment. I've only shown Tasmania. Um, you have different results in Queensland because it depends on the environment and the ability to do certain things. Um, so asparagopsis, you might be able to feed any low emissions supplement to animals in a relatively low, uh, relatively small paddock, but not so much in an extensive region. So the mitigation options that you have in extensive zones are most likely different to those um, for farmers in other zones. So I was talking to a farmer the other day and she was in, um, in um, not far from Alice Springs and she said, well, we're not allowed to plant trees. Legislation doesn't allow us to plant trees. We would look at planting salt bush to improve soil carbon, but not allowed to plant trees. Um, stacking or combining multiple options. So if you look at pasture, if you look at animal, animal improvements, improvement. if you look at whole business interventions is most likely to result in greater effect on productivity, profitability and emissions. But of course, more complex, and you need more skills and you might need more labor to do it. Um, Planting trees generally has a greater effect on farm emissions than soil carbon sequestration, particularly in cases where soil carbon stocks are already high. Um, reducing enteric methane. So for livestock farms, um, in the absence of land use change, enteric methane is the biggest. So it's gonna be 70 or 80% of your farm emissions will be enteric methane. That's methane they breathe out. So don't focus on the small things if you're aiming to reduce whole farm emissions. Focus on enteric methane. That's assuming a static system. Uh, that's assuming a, a system that's relatively unchanged. If you come along and you deforest half of your farm, well, land use change emissions will be the biggest. In the absence of any of those changes, enteric methane will be the biggest. So don't fiddle around around the edges with smaller emissions like soil carbon or whatever, when your biggest emission will be enteric methane. How can you reduce that? Um, interventions that reduce Emissions, sequester carbon and increase production efficiency are more, more likely to be profitable under future climates. Carbon farming in a way is really just methods to improve production efficiency. If you improve your production per unit input, you generally improve your profitability. Um, really the, the most sustainable systems are ones that are, have high carbon and in some contexts have high biodiversity as well. Um, so we're lucky in that they move in the same direction. Um, sustainable farming systems and carbon farming tends to sequester carbon. It's not the other way around where high carbon sequestration systems are unprofitable and unproductive. So that's all I had to say. Uh, happy to take any questions and um, hopefully that was about the time that you wanted, Rachel. Perfect. Thanks, Matt. That was really interesting. I've got some questions, but I will politely offer the floor. So um, 
any of our guests that have questions first. Did anyone have a question that you can raise your hand and unmute if you do? I think, Sean, you've yeah. unmuted. Yep, you um, go. <laughs> get my mic happening. Thanks, Matthew. That was very succinct. Well done. Um, just wondered if you looked at um, pasture diversity. I'm aware of some prairie grassland research that found um, high soil carbon rates uh, with, tracking quite well with diversity of above ground uh, pasture species. I, I guess that's some sort of, um, uh, you know, niche compartmentalising in the soil with different root zones. Yeah, so that's a good question, Sean. Um, uh, pasture diversity was sort of captured in that incorporating lucerne one. So the existing pasture was mainly a mono grass, uh, monoculture of grass. Um, so incorporating lucerne slightly increased diversity. Probably the thing about diversity is it depends on the existing state. So if you've already got a pasture that's already diverse, um, if you try and make, increase that diversity, it's not going to have any effect. If you start off with a grass only, and then you aim to improve the diversity of that, well, then you probably you probably will have an effect on not just soil carbon, but uh, but above ground dry matter as well. Soil carbon is difficult to know what's happening because of the soil type um, and the root depth. But in general, if you improve ground cover and you improve above ground biomass production seasonally, not just in a few seasons, and you maintain it, um, your soil carbon will go up. Probably the reason for so much confusion about soil carbon is it's very contextualised. So if you're five or six or seven percent soil carbon now, your ability to go up with any intervention is probably not much. If you're down at one um, percent or you've got a very bare paddock or it's been overgrazed or it's been cultivated several times, your ability to go up with respect to soil carbon from today, your baseline is high. So it's very much dependent on the initial state and where you are today. Thanks very much, Matt. Um, Chris Norman, you've got a question. Thanks, Matt. Great presentation. Did you look at irrigation properties at all, Matt? Because my understanding is that waterlogging poor drainage leads to greater nitrous oxide greenhouse gas emissions than, than vaccinations does. For methane? Yeah, that's a good question, Chris. Um, not in this, um, in this, in another project, we're looking at adaptation to waterlogging, but not in this one, no. But what you say is exactly right. Waterlogging not only increases nitrous oxide um, because it sort of goes anoxic, it also increases in some contexts methane from the soil uh, mm. and it slows down uh, carbon sequestration. On the other hand, if you've got a wetland, that's permanently waterlogged, your ability to increase soil carbon is high in there, but you also produce methane from it. So again, I come back to my point about, think about all, think about the whole system holistically, think about nitrous oxide, CO2 and, and methane. But um, it's a good point, yeah. Thanks, Chris, and thanks, Matt. Um, well, I'm waiting to see if anyone else has a question. I have a question. Um, the thing that was pretty stark about your presentation, I thought, Matt, was I suppose that really across most scenarios, it looks like soil carbon sequestration potentials decreasing within warming climate. Um, given the permanence periods for soil carbon projects, 25 to 100 years, do you think this is something that you we should be encouraging people to invest in or is the risk really quite high? Um, yeah, so again, it depends on the values and the motivation of the individual landholder. As I say at the start, um, I spoke to someone yesterday and he was nearing retirement and um, he, um, without giving away identities, he was in central Victoria. Um, he owned a very large property. Um, he was nearing retirement. And he was just wanting cash flow. So he was keen to have a go at soil carbon, uh, selling his soil carbon for cash flow. Um, if I was a farmer, I wouldn't be recommending marketing soil carbon uh, simply because, as you say, Rachel, um, usually soil carbon markets are 25 to 100 years that's for the erf but for voluntary markets it can be different voluntary markets are things like vera um, yeah and so you do have different times but the likelihood of getting a drought in that 25 or 100 year period probably pretty high so the likelihood of your soil carbon stocks going down is probably very high some it is worth noting though that some markets um, do have a ratcheting mechanism so if you lose soil carbon you don't have to pay it back not all of them do some of the european ones don't 
And so it very much depends on the market. But if it was me, to put it simply, I wouldn't be trading soil carbon because it's ephemeral. Um, it can go up, it can go down. Um, if you get a drought, it will go down. But under a warmer climate, your ability to hold soil carbon will also go down because your soils are respiring more. The other point is um, if you're wanting ACUs and you're wanting a carbon neutral business and you want to market a carbon neutral product, milk, beef, beef sheep, uh, wool, milk, whatever it is, or eggs, um, you can't market a carbon neutral product if you've sold your ACUs. Um, if you've sold your ACUs, you've got money for it, but you can no longer claim you're a carbon neutral business unless you sequester more carbon. So what do you really want to do? Do you want a premium for your product? Do you want a carbon neutral do you want a carbon neutral business or do you want immediate cash flow, sell your carbon now and when your prices go up, market prices go up in future, you won't be able to get it unless you sequester more carbon. So, I mean, it depends on what people's motivation is. I know what I'd be doing, but um, yeah. Thanks very much, Matt. Um, did anyone else have a question? Let's see any just at the moment. The other thing that I suppose I noticed just towards the end of your slides, Matt, when you're going through the example, was that even in the, um, in the towards carbon neutral example where you had basically stacked everything available within that property, you still weren't at carbon neutral. Like it wasn't possible in that scenario, I guess, to achieve carbon neutrality. So is that, I mean, how much of a, of a challenge do you see that? Like is, I mean, are there other options that might come online or make it, make it, um, possible to get there or I suppose are farmers going to be looking at offsets if they want to claim neutrality? Yeah, that's a really good question and that hits the nail on the head right where we're at now. Um, the regional reference group or the farmer group said, well, we don't want towards carbon neutral, we want carbon neutral now. So that what they've tasked us with for the transformational one, which I didn't talk about, is what's the cost of being carbon neutral? So we don't want to wait 10 years to become carbon neutral, we want to be carbon neutral in the next year. Um, so what we have to do, and, and I don't have an answer to that good question, Rachel, is what is the cost of being carbon neutral? So because we have them incremental adaptations, we can stack together more of them. I didn't show all of them, but we can get the lowest price, stack them together so that we're carbon neutral. And that's a year on year thing. So some years you might be a bit higher, some years it might be a bit lower, but it has to be year on year carbon neutral. So that's a really good question. You've got a lot of stuff in that towards carbon neutral. Um, and so it's quite a complex change, but uh, how much we actually have to add to that to get carbon neutral, I'm not sure. So that's a good question. Thanks, Matt. Kate, you've got a question? It was just a very logistical one, actually, Matt. I'm curious about the actual life cycle of your project, because it sounds like you're doing such interesting stuff. You've got more questions to ask. So how much longer, longer for the project to run and when can we be hearing um, information being generated by the project? Yeah, so that's a good question, Kate, and uh, good to see you again. I've, um, that one, that Nexus project will finish in May next, next year. It's a, bit, it's a bit of a synchronous thing. That will, asynchronous rather, that will finish in May. That biochar experiment that I talked about will finish at the end of next year. The carbon storage partnership will go for another five, four or five years. So that's um, that the carbon storage partnership is all about mitigation, whereas the Nexus project is more about adaptation, climate change adaptation. So um, we can use the beneficial findings out of Nexus in the carbon storage partnership. So basically, okay. we don't want to start from scratch. We want to build off um, the work that we've done sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, because there seems to be a synthesis piece, doesn't there? So when you talk about it's the whole system stupid, um, it's like there are other bits of research that are happening that are about some of those tools, for example, but don't necessarily bring that tool into the whole farming system or the whole ecological system in a sense. So it's just, it's fantastic to see you bringing that all together. And I guess it would be great to see more of that happen and to learn more from that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Kate. You should have a chat to MLA. Um, <laughs> but uh, but, uh, but pro probably the point that I would make though is that, um, People talk about carbon markets, and as Rachel said just before, carbon markets not today or tomorrow, it's 25 years or 100 years. So what's the likelihood that you get climate change in the next 25 years? Probably more than 95%. 
temperature is going up year on year, um, not projected, not modelled. You can just go and look at the bomb data. You can just have a look at the plot. Anyone can get it online. It's going up. Extremes, which I don't know whether I can actually show or not in that presentation, but extremes, um, if I just go back. Um, so temperature is going up. So this is just, hopefully you can see my screen now, but temperature, this is just across the whole of Australia, average surface temperature. We've gone up about one degree in the last 40 years. So that's not modelled. That's just real data off BOM. Um, and you can see the distinct turning point at about 1980. So that's average surface temperature. And people might say, well, one degree is not much. But if, it's, if you actually look at the extremes, the actual percentage of land surface area getting exposed to extremes, particularly extreme heat, decile 10 is 10 out of 10. So it's the worst 10 out of 10 years. Um, you can see that the percentage of Australian surface area is going up exponentially. So we've gone up since about 1970, hardly any, to 2020, nearly 80% of the continent is hitting extremes and decile 10 that they've never seen before. So, you know, yeah, I guess I come back to the point that that's not really modelled, that's measured. So that's actually what's happening. Um, anyway, sorry, I diverge. Thanks, Matt. It's very uh, important to have it in context, I think, because that's why the carbon market exists, really, isn't it? To try and um, capture carbon and, and, you know, mitigate against this climate crisis. Yeah, it's, um, it, I mean, yeah. It, it is, mitigation is to pull greenhouse gas or pull CO2 effectively and mm -hmm. methane out of the atmosphere so that the effect of warming is less. But in that time, warming will still continue. So your ability to sequester carbon won't be what it is today in 25 years. And 25 years is the short period. 100 years is, is the alternative. Yes, and it seems, I mean, it, it was very interesting in terms of your graphs. I mean, you were, obviously, there's a big, um, there was a focus on productivity and profit as well through that period. And I suppose I'm wondering whether um, within that, people are going to have to accept productivity going down if they want to sequester carbon. I mean, for example, in that example you were talking, I mean, you looked a bit at the potential for increasing tree cover and so on as part of the towards carbon neutral target. Um, and I wonder whether that's just something people are going to have to accept that they might need to, in grazing systems, for example, put a higher percentage of their land into trees if they want to achieve carbon neutrality and whether that's part of the conversation because I know you guys are doing some work around re the regen, regenerative ag sort of models as well. Yeah, that's a good question uh, Rachel the simple answer is that um, pasture production will will generally go up a little bit in winter because it's usually cold that hold, holding back pastures at least in southern regions production because it's just too cold to grow there's plenty of moisture we hit spring um, and there's plenty of moisture and plenty of temperature and growth rates go gangbusters um, but then the end of the season the shoulder um, the, the time of when rainfall starts declining towards summer will come in in future climate so Overall, your pasture production will go down because the shoulders, as they say, the autumn break and the end of the season will come in. So you get a later autumn break and you get an earlier finish. Um, that's in southern Australia. If you think about northwestern Australia, up in Broome, um, Port Hedland up there, they're getting more rain. It's actually getting more and more and more with climate change. So you can think about geographical redistribution where people <laughs> move up there. But southeastern Australia has seen a decline in rainfall for the last 20 years. It's gone down and down and down. Thanks, Matt. That's, um, it's been a really fantastic presentation discussion. Um, did anyone have a last question? Claire? Hey, um, this is obviously not at all my area of expertise, but I've just been thinking, how can we equip our staff in regional bodies to be able to provide advice to farmers who are, who are coming to us for advice on carbon farming, mixed with biodiversity, mixed with productivity and profitability increases. Like how, how on earth can we, the, I like your take home messages, but rules of thumb are kind of what I'm, I just wonder how we can, how we can um, draw on some rules of thumb in our advisory um, roles. Um, yep. um, yeah. So if, if first of all, depends on what your enterprise is. If you're livestock, you should be focused on enteric methane. Um, often difficult to feed a supplement, which is the easiest way to reduce emissions, but 
you can think about improving herd health, cull unproductive animals, fatten up lambs faster. So focus on the big emission first. So if you're livestock, you should be focused on methane. If you're a cropping enterprise and you don't have any livestock at all, if, you, if you're uh, broad acre cropping, your biggest um, greenhouse gas emission is most likely nitrous oxide, not CO2. Um, so focus on better use of nitrogen fertiliser, and that is simply mostly applying it at sowing time, burying it under the soil. Urea, um, applying urea, spreading it, is a big loss of nitrous oxide. So focus first, depending on your enterprise, on the major greenhouse gas emission. And in doing that and ignoring everything else, you'll have the biggest effect on greenhouse gas emissions. The, the other thing is um, co-benefits. Um, so the income that you get from productivity gains is a lot more than the income you can get from any carbon. So think about what's the co-benefit associated with any potential emissions mitigation option. If you're thinking of planting trees, um, do, do farmers need shade? Can they plant the trees along a fence line so that they shade animals in the summer, depending on where they are? If they're in a windy coastline where it's cold in the winter, can, can it be a shelter? Can they actually reduce wind chill and um, improve energetic loss because the animals are behind that? Um, if it's building up soil carbon, can you build up fertility and therefore improve your crop productivity? So in any intervention, think about co-benefits, but also think about trade-offs. So what's going to be the downside associated? Because if you come along and you in, impose a, an intervention with a co-benefit, uh, that's likely to have a greater effect on your profit than the effect of carbon itself. Hopefully that wasn't too much of a tongue twister, Claire. No, that's good. Thank you. That's going to take a while to penetrate into here, the simple messages, but um, but thanks. That's a good um, start. But, yeah, well, the main thing would be, well, what, what enterprise are they? Um, yeah. And focus on the big emission first. Don't fiddle around at the edges because there's, there's about 100 different pathways people could use. People say, oh, I'll, I'll focus on soil carbon. And soil carbon resulted in a 2% change, even though enteric methane swamps your emissions and they're focused on soil carbon is going to do nothing. 2% of nothing is nothing. Um, if you focus on reducing enteric methane, even just a little bit, it'll have a massive effect on greenhouse gas emissions. If you're a cropping enterprise, just focus on better nitrogen management, less application, more timely, um, right placement, the depth in the soil and the right rate. Um, yeah, because I feel I, I feel like sometimes, well, I think about optimising for several different objectives and that's where I was, yeah, um, but you're saying keep it simple. Yeah, well, the main thing that I get from talking to people, well, I get lots of things, but the main thing I get is um, well, where do I start? There's so many things that I could do, I don't know what to do. There's too many, I don't know how to start. And I always say, well, what is your, what is your enterprise? Then first focus on your main emission and just do that one emission first. Um, people talk about, um, I'm going to put solar panels on the roof of the shed. And uh, I mean, that's that's beneficial if you're a resident residential uh, person and you don't own a farm. But if you've got livestock, the, by far the biggest um, greenhouse gas emissions is enteric methane. So you should be focused on that. Um, and a simple way to do that is, is improve reproduction efficiency of your herd. Cull unproductive animals, get rid of them. Um, fatten up juvenile animals faster. If you're selling lambs at 50 kilos, can you fatten them up a little bit faster, like two or three weeks faster and sell them earlier? You reduce a significant proportion of lifetime enteric methane emissions. So your, your whole farm emissions have gone down simply because you've fattened them up faster and they're off the place faster. Thanks very much, Matt. We've had a question from Susan in the chat, which is about um, the availability of an enteric, um, an enteric emissions vaccine. Um, I was wondering about that too, I suppose, because enteric emissions, I know that they've just, asparagopsis, I think, is now being trialled commercially in South Australia, but it's not sort of widely available. I know there's a few other things, but I suppose what's the availability of something, that, you know, like a vaccine coming online that might be more available for people across Australia? Yeah, so the pharma groups that we've worked with have said, yeah, we want a vaccine. We could use an enteric methane vaccine. I'm not aware of one that's available at the moment. Um, probably one of the advantages of looking at a whole farm system with the modelling is to say, well, even though it's not available, if it was and it 
and it had X effect on an individual animal, what effect would it have at the whole farm level? So we looked at the effect that it would have if it was available. There is research being done on an enteric methane inhibitor vaccine. Um, there's research being done on a bolus, so that's for cattle. You stick the bolus down their throat and it gradually re reduce, releases this um, anti-methanogenic substance for, the, for a long time. I don't know how long it lasts for. The Dutch have got a device, so it's more of an engineering solution that sits over the animal's head, or sort of at the sides, and it, um, it, it oxidises uh, methane as it comes out of their nostrils, so they breathe into it and it just converts it to water. So it's more of an engineering thing, but again, it's, that's sort of high labour as well. Um, and I mean, feeding a supplement, well, you know, how do you put a paddock, a trough in a paddock every day sort of thing, and you've got to move it every day like we're doing with the biochar. It's not that practical. So probably if it was me, I would be focused on improving reproduction efficiency and improving overall herd health by getting rid of unproductive animals, by fattening up lambs and calves faster, and making sure that the stocking rate matches your environment. Have you got too many animals? Some people in Tasmania have gone a little bit high on the stocking rate, even though we've had a good winter. So if you can get rid of animals and optimise your stocking rate, um, well, your need for supplementary feed will go down, but your whole farm emissions will go down as well because you reduced enteric methane. Thanks, Matt. We've got one last question I'll take from Ross. Thanks, Ross. G'day, thank you, Matthew. Um, I'd be interested in your opinion. We're doing some work with utilities in, in nutrient offsets and we're converting old cane land back to wetland or old cattle grazing land back to wetland and removing the cropping and the animals or livestock altogether. Um, ultimately, the process for the nutrient offset is denitrification or or releasing greenhouse gases, essentially. Um, I'd be interested in your thoughts on how that balance might be in terms of the overall benefit, given their co-benefits in the wetland itself. Yeah, well, that's a good, that's a very complex question, uh, <laughs> Ross. Uh, but um, probably, uh, again, looking at all three greenhouse gas emissions, if you're flooding a, a land that was once dry land um, and you're keeping it permanently wet or wet most of the year, your carbon stocks and your carbon content is likely to go up. So there'll be stuff there that grows that didn't grow before. So a peat, a peat soil, which is not what you get in broad acre agriculture, but a peat is a long-term uh, wetland soil. So that can be up to 50% organic carbon by mass, which is massive, considering most broad acre soils are about 6 or 7%. Um, so you get increase in soil carbon, but you will, as you say, you get a loss of nitrogen. So you get denitrification, so nitrous oxide will come off. You can also get methane emissions from the soil. So rice paddies in Thailand and Singapore suffer from that a lot. They, get, they look at approaches for alternative wetting and drying their soils to get the same yield of rice, but to reduce the methane. So, I mean, that's another opportunity for another research project, Ross. But, um, you know, what, what is the trade-off? So you'll have methane coming off, you'll have nitrous oxide coming off, but you'll be sequestering carbon. What is the balance? I don't know. Thanks very much uh, for the question, Ross, and thanks very much, Matt, for joining us. Um, thanks. Uh, it's been a really fascinating discussion and, um, yeah, definitely keen to keep in touch about the, the, the reporting that's coming out of the Nexus project. Uh, yeah, thanks, up, I think you said thanks. next May. So, thanks for yeah, the thanks invitation to um, talk and thanks for everyone for hanging with it. It was a long presentation, probably hopefully wasn't too boring. <laughs> no, it was fascinating. Thanks very much, Matt.